Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be back again uh, with the renal rounds. And this time we have Professor Vivekanand Jha to talk about uh, a new facts about an old disease, the post-infectious glomerulonephritis. Let's see whether it's uh, old wine in the new bottle or there are some newer things about this disease which which I'm, I'm sure you're going to uh, learn more about from Professor Vivekanand Jha. And Vivekanand Jha doesn't require any introduction to you. Uh, Vivek, is all yours. Thank you, sir. Again, good, good evening, everyone. So we'll talk about uh, post-infectious glomerulonephritis. In today's world, when you go to conferences, there are always uh, recent advances and people talking about genetics and genomics and, and stem cell therapy and newer dialysis techniques, etc. So I thought it was time to revisit an old friend. Uh, that was a very common examination question when, uh, when I was a fellow and, and I'm sure when Professor Kerr was a, a fellow as well. But there is a possibility that you may need to uh, you may need to address that question as well because the number of new facts are emerging now, which are making this disease also a little bit more interesting uh, to the current day generation as well. So let's see what do we have. So uh, just one second. There seems to be some technical glitch with. Okay. All right. Right. So I hope you can see the slides now. The slide is moving. So let's start with the history since, since we called it an old disease. So the history started actually in the 17th century, so almost two and a half centuries ago, when there were some descriptions of edematous swelling and dark and suppressed urine, which was considered to be a feared complication of the convalescent period of what was described as scalatina or, or, or scarlet fever. You know, then if we move forward a couple of centuries in the mid 19th century, in the 1840s, etc., uh, the association between anasarca and clinical findings of uh, or nephritis after infection were, were recognized by a number of nephrologists, uh, prominent amongst whom was Richard Bright, who we know very well. Uh, and in the same century, but uh, later, Streptococcus was isolated and it was identified as. Uh, therefore, as the first pathogenic trigger of acute post-infectious glomerulonephritis, I think historically it has been it has been thought of as a typical childhood disease, and that is something also which might be changing. So, if we look at the clinical presentation, I, I get a message saying that someone is not able to hear the audio. I hope it's not the case with others. Uh, I hope you can hear us, Dr. K. Yes, I can. Yeah, so I'm sure everyone else can hear me as well. So we'll go back to the presentation. So this is something which is well known that the clinical presentation can uh, can vary uh, from asymptomatic hematuria to not shown here, acute nephritic syndrome, uh, but also can go on to a severe form of uh, glomerulonephritis, which is commonly called rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. In terms of symptomatology, uh, 60 to 70 percent of the affected individuals have edema. Gross hematuria is seen in about a third to about a half. Hypertension is present in a majority, and a small number of, uh, especially children, can also present with hypertensive crisis. And these are the typical urine findings. On, on the left, you see uh, microscopic hematuria. And on the right, you see uh, uh, RBC cast, which is one of the pathognomonic uh, clinical features of acute glomerulonephritis. We can't say post-infectious because post-infectious diagnosis depends on, on history and on the basis of uh, us finding the evidence for uh, a recent infection uh, through some serological investigations, uh, which are in the form of various types of anti-streptococcal antibodies and you will find which antibodies in any textbook of nephrology. The other uh, common features are low total, uh, uh, co uh, low complement 
CH50. Uh, it is found uh, in, in, to be low in about 90% of the cases and C3 levels are low also. Uh, normally we don't, when we make clinical diagnosis of acute nephritic illness and uh, find evidence of streptococcal infection and make a diagnosis of post streptococcal glomerulonephritis, we don't usually biopsy such, uh, such children because usually they're children. But if we were to biopsy, these are the typical findings that, that we would get. We would get what is known as endocapillary proliferative glomerulonephritis, which means that, is, that there is proliferation of endothelial cells and mesangial cells. And endothelial cells often completely block the capillaries, and that leads to some decline in glomerular filtration rate. But you can also see, as, as, as shown in the picture on the right panel, uh, a crescence. Uh, so here you can see a crescent, and crescents in post infectious glomerular nephritis are typically uh, not circumferential, uh, they're, uh, they're segmental, and they can, they can be focal. So they're small crescents. Uh, but they can be found, so don't be surprised if you see some crisis. We do know that this is the commonest cause of acute glomerular nephritis in children all around the world. And according to estimates, just about half a million or, or five lakh cases are identified annually worldwide. What is remarkable that it, a vast majority of these cases are found in poor countries. And the annual incidence from different parts of the world is uh, reported to vary for, from about 10 to about 30 per lakh individuals. It is worth noting that epidemic foci are still present in, in developing countries. And uh, in many such instances, uh, these foci are missed because the presentation are subclinical. Uh, and of course, we know that this is most frequently described after streptococcal infection. And as I said, subclinical disease is very common as, as much as five to 20 times more frequent than clinical disease. And then, therefore, uh, the actual number of cases act, is much more than, uh, than what might be reported. Uh, the highest risk group are in children between the ages of five to 12. And also this is something which is new that elderly individuals over the age of 60 are also particularly prone to a special form of uh, infection associated glomerular nephritis. And, and in this, uh, group especially men are at particularly increased risk uh, just because of the fact that you see a lot of infections in the tropics this condition is encountered much more frequently in tropics now uh, again if you recall your uh, memory of post streptococcal nephritis we know that there are uh, nephrit nephritogenic streptococcal strains and if an individual contracts this infection uh, due to one of these nephrotogenic strains, uh, that person carries as much as one third uh, likelihood of developing a glomerular disease. So, as I said, uh, the prevalence of the so called post infectious glomerular nephritis, and the reason I put it in quotes will become apparent later in the talk, uh, uh, the prevalence in adults has increased from uh, previously reported about 4% to as high as 34%. And uh, these conditions, these uh, patients are typically older individuals who have multiple comorbidities and the glomerular nephritis is, is typically in contrast to children where it is most frequently after streptococcal infection. Uh, in adults, it is after staphylococcal infection. So this is a, a table showing the epidemiology in both the developed and the developing world. So the industrialized countries or developed world data comes from Italy where uh, the, the, the prevalence is about uh, three, less than 3%. And in elderly, uh, it is uh, about nine uh, cases per million population per year. Whereas in developing countries, the, uh, the, the, uh, the overall incidence is about 250 to 300 per million population per year. Whereas in elderly, it is much less. So this is something which is, uh, which is uh, which is different between the two uh, parts of the world, both developing as well as uh, a developed world. So now, even though I, I mentioned that streptococcus is the most common antecedent infection that is associated with post-infectious glomerular nephritis, glomerular nephritis has actually been reported after a large, large number of uh, infections. And this table gives, uh, I'm sure, uh, only a partial list of all the infectious agents 
that have been reported to be associated with post infectious glomerulonephritis. And if you want to actually get this list, you can go to this reference, uh, which, which came only last year, and, and you will be able to find a detailed uh, list of reference. Uh, so there are a number of other specific types of infection which have been associated with glomerulonephritis, and these specific types of infection are infective endocarditis, and the type of infective endocarditis which have been which has been most frequently associated with glomerulonephritis is what was earlier called uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis, uh, which was uh, as as the name suggested subacute illness. Uh, in contrast to the acute types of bacterial uh, infective endocarditis, which are encountered more frequently these days, and the subacute infective endocarditis has come down quite significantly in frequency. Uh, then there, there was shunt nephritis, and shunt nephritis was associated with uh, uh, infection of the ventricular peritoneal shunts, which was uh, put in, uh, in in individuals who were suffering from hydrocephalus. And the, in, uh, and the offending organism here was Staph epidermidis. Uh, the third type of specific infection was vis visceral or deep, uh, deep visceral sepsis. In this case, uh, often intra-abdominal uh, abscesses, which went undiagnosed for a significant period of time, uh, were picked up when a patient presented with glomerulonephritis. So now let's look at, so I'm not going to talk to you too much about post streptococcal glomerulonephritis because you can find that in, in your descriptions and in, in the textbooks that you read. Uh, so let's come to some of these new, uh, new types of variants of glomerulonephritis which have now been reported. So staphylococcal glomerulonephritis, it is encountered, as I said, primarily in middle-aged or elderly patients. And these patients have an immunocompromised background such as diabetes, alcoholism, cancer, or IV drug addiction, which predispose them to develop this infection. Now, in contrast to post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, which is typically characterized by a latent period of two to three weeks, latency is usually absent in uh, staphylococcal glomerulonephritis. Also, in contrast to a PSGN, where renal failure at onset is rare, it is seen only in a small number of individuals, and there also the renal failure is uh, usually mild. In staphylococcal glomerulonephritis, renal failure is present in quite a significant number of individuals, and as many as 30% of these individuals go, go on to require dialysis. Uh, staphylococcal glomerulonephritis can also cause a, either a new onset or can worsen pre-existing heart failure. So that's, that can be another presentation. So if you see an elderly individual in hospital uh, who, who suddenly is showing evidence of heart failure, um, whereas previously it was, de it, was uh, it was sort of compensated, also suspect uh, the presence of staphylococcal glomerulonephritis. Now, uh, renal prognosis here is worse than is seen in PSGN, and these uh, patients with staphylococcal disease can also have associated cutaneous vasculitis. Uh, now let's uh, switch back and, and talk about uh, the pathogenesis of uh, post-infectious glomerulonephritis. Uh, post-infectious glomerulonephritis is a prototype immune complex disease, which is induced by, uh, as I said, specific nephro, uh, nephritogenic antigens. And we'll, we'll come to the new information about these antigens. <clears throat> How do these antigens uh, and lead to development of antibodies and, and uh, incitement of glomerular disease? Uh, is not exactly known, but there are a number of possible mechanisms. It is possible that bacterial antigens circulate in, in bloodstream and antibodies are generated and uh, these uh, antigen-antibody complexes form in bloodstream and then they get deposited. Uh, it is also possible that uh, the antigen first goes uh, into the glomerular circulation, gets filtered and, and gets deposited uh, on the other side of the uh, glomerular basement membrane. And then, uh, so these are deposited antigens, and then the antibody comes in secondarily and actually combines with this antigen uh, in situ. The third possibility is that uh, these antigens lead to development of antibodies in the circulation. These antigens don't go in and deposit themselves in, in glomerular capillaries, but the glomerular uh, basement membrane has certain pre-existing antigens which cross-react with, uh, with these bacterial antigens. And since antibodies 
also fail to recognize the difference between uh, the bacterial antigen and this uh, uh, this self antigen, uh, which is a phenomenon called molecular mim mimicry. Uh, uh, there is an in situ immune complex deposition due to this reason. And finally, and this is a somewhat new concept, uh, which suggests that uh, streptococcus, in addition to its antigens, it also lead, uh, leads to elaboration of this enzyme called neuraminidase, which can cause modification of immunoglobulins. Uh, it can also lead to generation of anti-nuclear antibodies, anti-C1Q antibodies, ANCA, rheumatoid factor, which means that these are all auto uh, um, antibodies produced due to autoimmune reactivity. And this is what uh, what you, this cartoon depicts. So you have the uh, endothelium, you have the glomerular basement membrane, and then you have the uh, epithelial side where we have the uh, uh, normal food processes of the protocytes sit. So you have this uh, pathogenic nephrotogenic uh, antigen, which is the most commonly accepted theory, which somehow goes through these barriers and deposits itself here. And then you have these antibodies. Antibodies uh, also cross this barrier and then come and uh, lead to in situ immune complex formation. So this is the uh, currently accepted theory of, uh, uh, of, uh, of development of post infectious glomerulonephritis. And after it has deposited, the antigen antibody complex has deposited here. As we know, uh, immune complex lead to uh, activation of classical complement pathway, and then the complement uh, leads to damage in the in the tissue. So again, there are a number of new theories which have uh, now developed in relation to staphylococcal infection. So there is this uh, this concept called super antigens. What are super antigens? Super antigens. Uh, are, and, uh, are molecules which, which go beyond just uh, generation of antibodies. So in this case, uh, the specific antigen called staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome antigen, it can also activate T cells, and these T cells thereby lead to polyclonal B cell activation, and uh, polyclonal B cell activation leads to elaboration of IgA, IgG, and IgM. And here you can see in bold IgA, because IgA is generated really in excess amounts in, in this situation. Then uh, a, a possibility of predisposition has also been uh, suggested, uh, which has been uh, actually uh, suggested because of familiar clustering of cases. And in some studies, uh, the association of post-infectious glomerular nephritis with some HLA alleles have, uh, has been found. Uh, it has also been suggested that uh, diabetics can have subclinical mucosal infection, and diabetics also have a reduced uh, ability to clear IgA because uh, in, in diabetes, IgA undergoes hyperacylation. So these silic acid residues can reduce the clearance of IgA in, in diabetics. And so therefore, again, the amount of diabe uh, IgA in, in, in these individuals actually increases. Now, the, uh, the relevance of this will become clear a little bit later. So what are the specific ne other uh, nephritogenic antigens? So there are two specific uh, uh, nephritis-associated antigens which have been described. One has been described from Japan, uh, shown here in the top box, and the second has been described from Europe and Americas. So what is the evidence uh, in favor of uh, the role of these antigens? So uh, various workers, and I have summarized the evidence here, and, and the references are at the bottom of the slide, uh, that there is an elevation in urinary plasmid activity, uh, which is observed in individuals with post streptococcal glomerular nephritis. Also, uh, these, both of these antigens have been demonstrated in renal biopsy samples. And in these biopsy samples, these antigens co localize with C1Q and they are found in epithelial hubs, which are characteristics of post streptococcal glomerular nephritis. And now finally, as we know, uh, ASO, et cetera, antibodies even to uh, these antigens are found in convalescent sera of patients with uh, post streptococcal glomerular nephritis. Uh, this is uh, this particular cartoon uh, from this. Uh, I, I, I would like to draw your attention to this, this uh, paper by uh, Professor Bernardo Rodriguez Eturbe from Venezuela, who has done a lot of pioneering work in post streptococcal glomerular nephritis. This is a 10-year-old paper, but still worth reading. And so he describes that 
uh, the NAPLR uh, actually goes and binds to the mesangium and glomerular basement membrane, and this leads to entrapment of plasmin, and uh, and thereby the plasmin and uh, uh, NAPLR it leads to sustained inflammatory activity, uh, attracts polymorphic nuclear leukocytes, monocytes, uh, and subse with subsequent degradation of glomerular basement membrane, and once the GBM degrades, the immune complex actually penetrates and uh, gets deposited and forms uh, this immune complex immediate glomerulonephritis. In the case of this uh, SPEB uh, antigen, uh, the anti uh, SPEB antibody is combined with the antigen, and this uh, this this can actually either the immune complex can get deposited or the SPE itself can go deposited and lead to uh, in situ uh, antigen antibody deposition again uh, leading to uh, elaboration of immune complex um, fridays so these are a few pictures which you can find in the ajkd uh, atlas of renal pathology showing some of the other manifestations of post epicoctal glomerulonephritis so here you can see a crescent and uh, this is uh, a, a case with uh, a late post infectious glomerulonephritis in which you see largely uh, largely mesangial uh, uh, mesangial expansion and mesangial hypercellularity uh, and endocapillary hypercellularity has reduced these are the various types of immunofluorescence patterns which have been described so the most common pattern in the early disease state is what is known as either a garland pattern Garland is formed because these immune complexes are deposited around the capillary loops, like forming a garland. And uh, in the late course of the disease, the, uh, the immune deposits disappear from the capillary loop, but they're still present in, in the mesangium, and so leading on to what is known as the mesangial pattern. And this is an electron micrograph which shows this subepithelial deposition. Uh, which, which is classically described as electron dense deposits leading to formation of uh, subepithelial humps. This is the late phase. Once again, you see uh, a mesangial proliferation and a mesangial uh, deposit. Now, here are two specific variants of uh, post infectious glomerulonephritis about whom we have learned in recent years. One is the IDA dominant post infectious glomerulonephritis, which, as I said earlier, is found uh, largely in in uh, individuals with staphylococcal infection. So in, in these cases, IgA deposits uh, predominate and, and are more intense than the uh, IgG deposits. And then the other type of post-infectious glomerulonephritis is C3 dominant PIGN. And C3 dominant PIGN you typically see in, uh, in late cases where the immunoglobulin has actually been cleared, but the complement deposits still remain. So here the question is, in the first case, how do you distinguish it from IgA nephropathy? So in IgA nephropathy, generally there is a lambda chain preponderance. So lambda is over, uh, if, you, if you stain an IgA nephropathy uh, biopsy with kappa lambda stain, the lambda, lambda staining is usually more intense. Whereas in post-infectious glomerulonephritis, both kappa and lambda chain are equally intense. So that is a differentiating feature. Whereas if you have a C3 dominant post infectious glomerulonephritis, what might be helpful is for you to go ahead and do a C4D staining. And if C4D staining is present, that means that there is classical pathway act, uh, complement activation, which is a feature of post infectious glomerulonephritis. Uh, whereas if the C4D staining is absent, that means classical pathway has not been activated, which is is a feature of IgA nephropathy. So these are some of the other uh, features that uh, that help us uh, uh, in the differential diagnosis of these two conditions. And again, I won't go into the details of all of these conditions. Uh, suffice to say that in, uh, um, in in C3 GN you see uh, you see a lot of uh, C3 nephritic factor, but it won't be found in uh, post-infectious glomerulonephritis. And uh, ESRD is somewhat more common in C3 glomerulonephritis. So a question has been asked more recently, can post-infectious glomerulonephritis transform into C3 glomerulonephritis? So the question that needs to be answered here is that just like we now know in cases of atypical hemolytic urinary syndrome, uh, 
there are certain genetic mutations which are uh, which are carried in individuals but remain asymptomatic until there is a specific trigger and uh, the question that has been asked is uh, whether uh, whether whether a similar situation might be present in which people who, who carry some sort of predisposing genetic mutations or might have auto anti uh, auto antibodies which affect uh alternative complement pathway regulation can they lead to unmasking of this condition and lead to predisposition or uh, development of uh, post infectious glomerular nephritis into c3gn and this uh, this hypothesis has been supported by the demonstration of this nplr uh, antigen which is an antigen for psgn which has also been shown in c3 glomerular nephritis uh, there is another new variant of uh, proliferative glomerular nephritis, which can be confused with post-infectious glomerular nephritis, which is the proliferative glomerular nephritis with monoclonal Ig Ig deposits. And the way you are going to uh, pick this condition up is that you will find that uh, there is presence of immunoglobulin, but when you stay in for light chain, you will find that only one, either kappa or lambda light chains, are. Are, are getting thin. And when you do uh, electron microscopy, you will not find any classical electrons then, electron dense deposits, which is a feature of post infectious gene. So we do know that there is a fair amount of clinical and prognostic variability in uh, individuals presenting with post infectious glomerular nephritis. So, as, as I said, uh, post infectious glomerular nephritis was typically a disease of children. But now we identify it in adults and in elderly. And as uh, described again earlier, elderly have uh, show features of reduced immune response. And uh, that uh, you know about 20 to 25% of the elderly who develop post-infectious or infection-associated glomerular nephritis will be dead within two months of diagnosis of this condition. A question which will often be asked in examinations uh, for those who are going to appear in your exit exams, uh, what are the indications for biopsying an individual with post-infectious glomerular nephritis? <clears throat> so you, you can encounter uh, this situation in, in both initial stages and during recovery phase. So if a patient has just presented to you but is showing a rapidly progressive course, if the hypertension persists, if GFR reduction persists, if somehow the complement levels are normal at the time of presentation, or if at the time of presentation you don't find any significant rise in type of anti streptococcal antibodies, if a patient has external manifestations which suggests uh, a systemic disease like lupus, etc., or if a patient presents with nephrotic syndrome, which is not the typical presentation, then you are justified in going ahead and recommending a biopsy. Whereas if you have a patient who presents to you late after onset, like a month or so, uh, and if the person continues to have depressed GFR, if the person continues to have low complements, which extends for more than three months, or proteinuria persisting for more than six months, or microscopic hematuria persisting for more than a year and a half, uh, the reason uh, that all these time, uh, the threshold time points are different, is that even in normal course, proteinuria and microscopic hematuria can persist for varying periods of time in post-infectious long nephritis. But if they are persisting for more than this, these defined periods, they possibly indicate presence of other diseases. Now, coming to management, most of the patients with uh, post-infectious long nephritis require only supportive care. Uh, if they have a lot of edema, they may need to be treated with loop diuretics. We need to, of course, manage their blood pressure, uh, a small proportion of uh, childhood uh, post-infectious glomerular nephritis and, and uh, about a third of those with post-infectious glomerular nephritis in adulthood may require dialysis. And uh, this management also might include renal biopsy, which, which we discussed in the previous slide. Now, often a question of immunosuppressive therapy is asked, but if the diagnosis is of post-infectious glomerular nephritis, then immunosuppressive therapy has not been shown to be helpful at all. Uh, it is potentially been used only in a situation where you have a rapidly progressive uh, glomerular nephritis type presentation. The follow-up care might um, vary depending on the age of presentation, 
So like I said, children typically carry good prognosis. So they also need to be followed up, but adults definitely need to be followed up uh, uh, much more aggressively. So in, if uh, the disease has uh, developed in a preschool uh, children, then about 95% of them will be expected to show full recovery. But like I said, hematuria may persist for several months. And uh, in some studies, uh, about a fifth have actually been shown to have residual urinary, urinary abnormalities even after 20 years. But please note that these were really old studies. And in these, uh, these cases, all these uh, individuals were not biopsied. And it is possible that some of these individuals with persistent uh, urinary abnormalities might have some other disease like IgA nephropathy, etc. In contrast to children, uh, about 30 to 70 percent of adults may be left with uh, CKD after a post infectious glomerular nephritis. And also, worth pointing out is that if uh, PSGN develops in epidemics, as used to be seen earlier, but it is much less now, uh, it has better prognosis than sporadic cases of PSGN. Now, more recently, some questions have been raised about nomenclature of uh, glomerular nephritis cases associated with infections. So Dr. Richard Glassock, who likes controversies, has uh, tried to differentiate between uh, these two types of diseases. So one he calls post-infectious glomerular nephritis. Uh, according to him, the definition, which makes sense uh, of PSG, uh, post-infectious glomerular nephritis is when it is preceded by an infection that has actually either completely resolved or is in the process of being uh, uh, resolving with or without treatment. And since it has resolved or is resolving, that means that there is a latent period of a few days to four weeks. And the latent period ends, of course, with an acute onset of glomerular nephritis. And uh, in terms of the causes, uh, Dr. Glassock says that post epicardial glomerular nephritis is the only well documented cause. Now, he uses another term which he calls infection related glomerular nephritis, in which case the infection is mechanistically related to glomerular nephritis and is a manifestation of an actual ongoing infection, which means that the glomerular nephritis presents when the infection is, is still active. And, and thereby, this is what is the essential feature differentiating it for, from post-infectious glomerular nephritis. And in this situation, a variety of causes, uh, bacterial, viral, fungal, parasitic, etc., have been described. So, he identifies a number of infection-related glomerular nephritis. So we know that IgA nephropathy, uh, which means an individual who has already been diagnosed with IgA nephropathy, can develop an acute flare. And we have all we, we all have read this in our textbooks, and it has been called synpharyngitic flare. So an individual with IgA nephropathy, if he or she develops a, a upper respiratory infection, they will show a flare in, IgA, uh, in the clinical manifestation of nephropathy. So that is also an infection-related GN. C3 nephritis uh, can also, uh, in, in an individual with a pre-existing established GN, can show an existing flare uh, or uh, increased flare in the presence of viral pharyngitis. post epicoccal glomerular nephritis we know well. We also discussed the staphylococcal uh, glomerular nephritis. And then there are a number of other types of de novo glomerular nephritis, which uh, which are associated with subacute infection, which could be either bacterial, viral, fungal, etc. And this, in, in this, the, the variations are much more. Uh, the duration can between the infections and uh, the onset of GN can be weeks to months. And, you know, and, and, and thereby it might often become difficult to establish this relationship with infection because the infection is old and might have been forgotten. So, in conclusion, uh, post-infectious glomerular nephritis is the most common cause of acute nephritis. Uh, epidemiology of post-infectious glomerular nephritis differs between developed and developing world. Uh, this uh, condition is caused by glomerular immune complex disease. Presentation is variable from asymptomatic microscopic hematuria to full-blown acute nephritic syndrome to nephrotic syndrome to RPGN. And uh, the diagnosis is made often on clinical grounds uh, the patient is presented with acute nephritic syndrome, and there is a history of recent infection, which you should be able to doc document. If you can't do document an infection, it is extremely difficult to make a diagnosis of post-infectious or infection-associated glomerular nephritis. Right now, there is no specific therapy for PIGN, 
And we do know that a subset will have residual renal dysfunction or progressive kidney disease, which means that we will need to follow up these individuals for quite a significant period of time. I think that is, uh, that is something that brings us to the end of this presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek, for...